Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lengel. So I will start by reading the blurb. That isn't Charles. Charles is gone. Charles and Meg and their friend Calvin travel through a wrinkle in time in search of their missing father. But can they beat the evil forces they meet on their dangerous journey through time and space? So I'm going to give you some overall thoughts first on this one, I think, and then we're going to go through and look at some of my tabs. So overall, I thought it was pretty competently written. It was almost Enid Blyton in, Blyton-y in a way. There was a lot of, um, you know, it, you could see the influence from uh, science fiction and fantasy, although it is definitely aimed at, you know, a middle grade audience, really. Although I do think, you know, parents would enjoy reading it to their kids and that sort of thing. The language was pretty well done. I liked that we learn phrases from other languages as well. So like Latin and French were both in here, which is pretty cool. I guess my problem is is that I have no real outstanding reason to love this book. Like, I didn't read it as a kid or anything like that. So I am reading it as an adult with the fact that it's also been super hyped up because of the movie coming out as well. And honestly, I just thought it was okay. I do think it's aged pretty well. Like, it doesn't feel outdated or anything like that. It's just that the story didn't really grab me, you know? Which is a shame because it sounds almost like middle grade Doctor Who, which should be quite good, I, I feel, but... So I'm going to check out some of my tabs and then we'll give it a rating. So the first thing is, is the first line. It was a dark and stormy night, which to me is a massive cliche as the first line. But I don't know whether this book helped to popularize that cliche, you know. So there's this great little conversation between Meg and Calvin and I totally side with Calvin. I can relate with him. With a sudden enthusiastic gesture, Calvin flung his arms out wide as though he were embracing Meg and her mother, the whole house. How did all this happen? Isn't it wonderful? I feel as though I were just being born. I'm not alone anymore. Do you realise what that means to me? But you're good at basketball and things, Meg protested. You're good in school. Everybody likes you. For all the most unimportant reasons, Calvin said. There hasn't been anybody, anybody in the world I could talk to. Sure, I can function on the same level as some everybody else. I can hold myself down, but it isn't me. One of the characters um, talks about having a willing suspension of disbelief, which is one of the things that as a writer you want your readers to have. It basically means that they you know, will overlook any implausibilities in the story or whatever because they're so invested in it, I suppose. Um, we're uh, investigating what happened to their, their missing father. And um, what he did was uh, what they call classified. Um, but Meg says she had an idea of where he was. Out in New Mexico for a while, we were with him there, and then he was in Florida at Cape Canaveral, and we were with him there too. Isn't So New Mexico is where Roswell is, right? And then Cape Canaveral, obviously known for rocket launches and whatnot. And then we get to the slightly preachy religious bit. Um, so, who have our fighters been, Calvin asked. Oh, you must know them, dear, Mrs. Watts had said. Mrs. Who's spectacles shone out at them triumphantly, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus! Charles Wallace said. Why, of course, Jesus. Mm. We have a use of the word smilingly, which is a word that I, I hate. <laughs> I thought this was a great quote. Um, so we've got, nobody suffers here, Charles intoned. Nobody is ever unhappy. But nobody's ever happy either, Meg said earnestly. Maybe if you aren't unhappy sometimes, you don't know how to be happy. Calvin, I want to go home. And I thought this was interesting. And uh, this goes back to, um, what is it? The Declaration of Independence, I think. Is it that? Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. We hold these truths to be self-evident, she shouted, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As she cried out the word, she felt a mind moving in on her own, felt it seizing, squeezing her brain. Then she realised that Charles Wallace was speaking, or being spoken through by it. But that's exactly what we have on Camazots, complete equality, everybody exactly alike. For a moment, her brain reeled with confusion. Then came a moment of blazing truth. No, she cried triumphantly. Like and equal are not the same thing at all. Good girl, Meg, her father shouted at her. But Charles Wallace continued as though there had been no interruption. In Camazots, all are equal. In Camazots, everybody is the same as everybody else. But he gave her no argument, provided no answer, and she held on to her moment of revelation. Like and equal are two entirely different things. And I think that that's something that we should remember, especially in... You know, today's days of, I suppose, forced equality. Being equal to somebody doesn't mean that you're necessarily like them. And that's what diversity should be about as well, you know? So they're talking about the happy medium. And uh, Calvin says, can't you see what's going to happen? Oh, no, not in this kind of thing. Mrs. Watts, it sounded surprised at his question. 
if we knew ahead of time what was going to happen, we'd be we'd be like the people on Kamazots with no lives of our own, with everything all planned and done for us. How can I explain it to you? Oh, I know. In your language, you have a form of poetry called the sonnet. Yes, yes, Calvin said impatiently. What's that got to do with a happy medium? Kindly pay me the courtesy of listening to me. Mrs. Watts's voice was stern, and for a moment, Calvin stopped pouring the ground like a nervous colt. It is a very strict form of poetry, is it not? Yes. There are 14 lines, I believe, all in iambic pentameter. That's a very strict rhythm or metre, yes? Yes, Calvin nodded. And each line has to end with a rigid rhyme pattern, and if the poem does not do it exactly this way, it is not a sonnet, is it? No. But within this strict form, the poet has complete freedom to say whatever he wants, doesn't he? Yes, Calvin nodded again. So, Mrs. Watts, it said. So what? Oh, do not be stupid, boy, Mrs. What's it scolded. You know perfectly well what I'm driving at. And then he says, you mean you're comparing our lives to a sonnet, a strict form, but freedom within it, which I think is a nice little comparison. We did have a bit of a cliche in that basically love is like the superpower at the end that comes to everyone's rescue. I thought this was interesting in the afterword written by, her, I believe it was her granddaughter as well, um, just to see the different reactions there were to this book. While the majority of the feedback my grandmother received over the years was positive, she also received expressions of fear and even hate. A Wrinkle in Time has been one of the most contested and most often banned books in libraries and schools in the United States. Graham was baffled by the charges of some Christian groups that it glorified witchcraft and New Age spirituality. On the other hand, she was equally flummoxed by criticism that it was too overtly Christian. For the fundamentalists, the book was certainly heretical. For literalists, who were fearful of the essential metaphorical nature of language, it was anathema. She antagonised the same crowd that would later want to burn the Harry Potter books. I love this thing down here as well. Um, according to another note on a draft, she changed Mrs. Watsit's age from 625 billion, 379 million, 152,497 years, 8 months and 3 days, to 2 billion, 379 million, 152,497 years, 8 months and 3 days, because the universe is only 5 or 6 billion years old, according to Isaac Asimov. I thought that was a nice little touch. So all in all, yeah, I mean, I did enjoy this. I don't really know whether it lived up to the hype. I, I do think there is a certain timelessness to it, and I did enjoy the writing, but I just think I would prefer to have been reading Enid Blyton myself, and I don't know if the story was necessarily mind-blowing. Um, I can see why the movie got fairly mixed reviews as well, because I think it's quite a marmite story. But um, definitely, I am glad that I read it. If it sounds interesting to you, then definitely pick it up as well. Um, yeah, it petered out a little bit towards the end, to be honest, but overall it was competent. I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. So there we go, that's what I thought of A Wrinkle in Time by Madeleine Lengel. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.